uh, where I clicked on the wrong link initially. Uh, now you're with us. That's important. Yeah. Uh, uh, can we begin now? Uh, shall we wait for one more minute uh, if course. others want to join and then uh, we can formally start? Sure, sure. Whatever yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks very much for organizing this. And I apologize in advance uh, for having to suddenly leave at just nine um, or just before nine, probably. I that's, that's fine. mixed up the dates and uh, have a meeting that I have to get to afterwards. That's yeah, I was told that I must start with you because you got to leave for yes, half no. an hour or so. Uh, right. I, I apologize for this. You'd also shifted the time on my behalf. So <laughs> I'll try to speak very briefly so that we can have at least maybe some conversation. All right, uh, uh, good evening everyone. And uh, thank you so much for joining uh, for this very special event. Today we have a very uh, interesting panel which will be talking about the current issues of uh, uh, the India-China standoff at the, the actual control or the, the supposed of actual control because there's nothing right now. So uh, 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 Dr. Maheshwar Singh will be moderating this event and uh, I'll be just giving slightly uh, a basic pointer about this event. So we have disabled the chat feature in case you have any queries and, and towards the end, please start your questions only in the Q&A feature, which will be available towards the bottom of your screen. And, and uh, the event is being recorded. And we really hope that you have a good time here. Thank you so much. Over to you, Dr. Singh. Thank you, Anand, for spelling out the housekeeping details. They're important. <laughs> uh, 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 let me formally welcome uh, the esteemed panelists uh, and uh, greeting to uh, Suhasni and uh, Jaydev Ranadi sir. Also, good morning to Sanjay, uh, who is uh, far away from us, sitting in Canada, I suppose. Uh, 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 now, all of you know that uh, this is an initiative of NLU Delhi Engage. And we keep holding uh, discussions of this sort and conversations of this kind on uh, issues of, uh, you know, sort of uh, 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 contemporary interest, uh, both ranging from law to politics and interface of law and politics. <clears throat> so this is uh, one more conversation in that series, uh, which is uh, titled uh, as the Galwan Gambit Lessons and Way Forward. Now, ideally, I would have uh, liked it to be the uh, Indo-China Indo standoff because uh, the standoff is still, uh, still on. The, the situation is uh, far from clear, at least uh, at one point. Uh, but, uh, 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 but let it be. Uh, so, <clears throat> For the sake of convenience, as I was saying a while ago, we have uh, divided this whole conversation into three parts uh, uh, with uh, all three of you around, uh, which is Sanjay, uh, Ranade sir, and Suhasini, to speak on the specific dimensions or aspects of the current issue, of course, to involve with historicity and so on. And uh, so, uh, formally, uh, let me introduce the panel to, 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 for, uh, for today's discussion. Uh, uh, to start with, uh, we're all very familiar with the expertise of uh, Jaydev Ranade. Uh, currently, is holding the presidentship of Center for Chinese Analysis and Strategy. Uh, he has served. Uh, uh, at the highest echelons of the government, uh, both uh, in India as well as abroad. And he was with the Indian Embassy in Washington. And uh, of late, uh, 
and uh, in the past also we have seen him uh, quite regularly on prime time television debates on on the on the issue uh, of uh, on the issues that are that have arisen out of uh, india china conflict uh, in galwan and elsewhere uh, he is uh, in that sense uh, he's worked with the government so with your permission sir, sir may i call you a critical insider who will uh, give us a perspective uh, 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 which is uh, uh, not very accessible to a large number of people uh, here uh, we're all uh, very familiar with uh, um, uh, with suhasni heather and her work uh, she is currently holding uh she is uh, the national editor uh national and diplomatic editor uh, diplomatic affairs editor uh, of the most reputed newspaper of india that is the hindu uh she has reported for television and print on conflict and foreign policy issues with a focus on the subcontinent and uh, she has always she has also been the foreign affairs editor and prime time anchor with cnn ibn 18 and uh, also worked with cnn international uh, at uh, with its new delhi bureau and uh, uh, she is known to have uh, held public conversation on matters related to security strategy and foreign policy with uh, uh, with the well known experts on the subject in their respective areas and uh, uh, sanjay is uh, very well known both in india and uh, across the euro atlantic world for his work on on uh, on the interface of law and political theory uh, in india his uh, his work uh, uh, sort of ranges from foreign policy to sino indian issues to political parties to you name it and he has uh, contributed uh, um, there and currently uh, he is a uh, alumnus and a doctoral degree holder from the university of cambridge and uh, uh, also he was uh, until recently till he uh, till he moved out to canada was uh, an associate professor with the prestigious new school of social research in uh, <clears throat> and uh, currently uh, he is uh, holding uh, you know, he is at the university uh, raisin university in canada uh, and uh, also holding the jaris jaris lavoski democracy chair in canada if I, i'm sorry it's a tongue twister so if i mispronounce it uh, forgive me for this uh, so let us start with uh, sanjay first <clears throat> uh, you have yes, uh, you have uh, written uh, on uh, on uh, the at least three meetings that uh, a summit level public diplomacy that happened between uh between uh, president g and Pre uh, prime minister narendra modi beginning with uh, amdabad and then moved to wuhan and uh, and uh, the last one was at mamalapuram in south of india uh now uh, on prime time television debate he's been taunted quite often for having engaged with uh, president z uh, uh, uh on the, on issues related to india and china uh but fundamentally uh i think it wasn't a irrational strategy on part of modi to to engage with xi jinping uh basically he was trying to uh, convey to xi jinping that uh, there is no fundamental antagonism even if there are differences even if there are suspicions between india and china so so as long as a framework 
could be worked out in which the relationship could be amicably managed, uh, then we can go ahead with it. So it, was, it wasn't a very rational strategy. Uh, having said this, <clears throat> uh, it has not borne fruit for multiple reasons. And the proverbial last nail in the coffin is uh, the standoff and unfortunate loss of uh, soldiers and officers on either side of the line of the country. Uh, so in your opinion, what is it that uh, Prime Minister Modi and President Xi Jinping were trying to achieve through the summit diplomacies or public diplomacy, if you like. And thank you for uh, for the question, and thank you for the for uh, the introduction as well. I'm really happy to join this conversation. I'll apologize in advance to everyone who's listening because I'll have to leave uh, early. Um, but let me let me try to. I, I wanted to say sort of two broad things, two broad sets of comments um, that might contribute to the discussion. Uh, the first is thinking about uh, Xi Jinping and Narendra Modi as two political leaders and what are the remarkable similarities between them. Um, and so that's the first thing I'll mention. And then the second is to think about the timing of this conflict, the, the severity of it, and what might be the, the causes and conditions that have allowed it to, to sort of emerge um, in this rather acute way. So first, I, I think one of the most striking things when you think about Modi and Xi Jinping uh, is, of course, that these are the strongmen of, of Asia at the moment. There are others, uh, Shinzo Abe in Japan. You think of uh, Prime Minister Erdogan in Turkey. Um, this is the age, as many people have talked about, of populism and strongmen. And we see that in both India and China. And I sort of think, when I think about the two leaders since they've come to power, roughly around the same time, 2012 Xi Jinping, uh, Narendra Modi 2014, you can think of five broad similarities that are quite remarkable. The first is a remarkable concentration and personalization of power uh, in their own office, right? Not since Indira Gandhi in India and not since uh, Mao Zedong have we seen in China a leader um, that has asserted his personal political authority to quite the same extent. Deng Xiaoping was a remarkable political leader in sort of Machiavellian terms in many ways, but part of his mastery of power was that he was very much behind the scenes. Xi Jinping is very much a contrast. He's out in front and center, like the prime minister in India today. The second thing that's very striking is the, uh, you might call it the intrusion or the extension of the parties that they both lead into the state apparatus. We see a reassertion of party control uh, after many reforms over the last 30 years that were inaugurated by uh, Deng Xiaoping. And also in India, as we know, uh, over the last five years, there is um, increasing blurring of the lines between party and partisan appointments and how the state apparatus is working. Third similarity you could think about is the, um, is the crackdown on political critics and social dissent, uh, both uh, in, in terms of the formal political arena and in civil society. We see um, rather aggressive worrying trends in both countries, um, certainly, and we can talk about that. The fourth one, which is quite interesting, is both leaders came to power and when they did, both uh, leaders had many proponents who said that they were going to liberalize the economy. There was going to be a new phase of industrial transformation in China and in India, um, despite the remarkable differences still between these two, these two political economies. But in fact, what we have seen more, more um, what we've seen more strongly since they both come to power is actually a, a greater presence of the state in the economy right, in both places. And then the, fat, and the, and then the fifth uh, similarity I think we can think about is the type of nationalism uh, that they both embody and that they both encourage, which is sort of a fierce majoritarian nationalism in both countries, um, which of course has very grave implications for minorities and the peripheries in both countries. So these are sort of, I would think of five remarkable similarities between these two leaders. And um, we could maybe do these types of comparisons between previous leaders, Dr. Manmohan Singh and Hu Jintao, for instance. Uh, when Deng Xiaoping was in power, it was Rajiv Gandhi for some period. We can do these types of comparisons. But I think if you look at India-China relations and leaders, um, the last time you would think of two leaders who were such towering figures, 
um, and who you think about in comparative terms, would have, you would have gone back to Jawaharlal Nehru and Mao Zedong, many would say. So this is a remarkable sort of moment in the history of both of these countries. And the fact that you have two powerful personalities at the top, I think is very important to try to understand how they're similar and different. And I think the similarities are quite, quite remarkable. So then on the question of the timing of the conflict, this clash, I think you can think of sort of three levels of analysis. The first are immediate triggers. Uh, China has always had an asymmetry of power in the region uh, in terms of infrastructural development. India was trying to rectify that in the last few years. Um, there's still an asymmetry of power and presence, but India has been trying to reassert itself in the region. Um, and the second one that China has talked about in public fora is the decision to null Article 370. So I personally think, of course, for constitutional reasons and democratic reasons, that that was a very deeply regressive decision on the part of the Indian government. But I think for, the, for understanding this conflict, what's quite remarkable is that these two triggers, um, the assertion of India's uh, sort of presence in the region, and it's an element of Article 370 in order to have direct control over Ladakh as a union territory now, is quite ironic and almost hypocritical from the Chinese point of view, because they themselves have been revising uh, the balance of power in the South China Seas. They've been asserting themselves in Xinjiang and of course in Tibet for a very long time. And you could say that what's happened in Kashmir uh, in the last year under this government in some ways resembles uh, the pattern and strategy that's happened in Xinjiang. So for the Chinese to say that somehow that this is, a, this is untoward of New Delhi um, seems quite ironic and hypocritical. I'm not something, it's not, it's not a move I'm endorsing, just to be clear. But it's remarkable that in fact, the, the, the sort of the policy or the pattern of statecraft in both these cases is quite similar. Um, so these are sort of immediate triggers. Um, and there I think the Chinese, certainly in international circles, at least I'm now sitting in New York, if you read the press here, read it in Canada, read it in Western Europe, there's a great deal of skepticism towards these kinds of arguments coming out of Beijing. Second thing we can think about is, of course, the conflict itself has a long history, as our other speakers, of course, most dress much better than I. Um, and we can think about in recent years, the standoff in Doklam. Uh, we can think about tensions over the Belt and Road Initiative, the CPEC, and the larger question of where is India's foreign policy headed? Uh, where, is its, where is its security alliances? Uh, in which direction are they moving? Um, and I think those broader, deeper tensions that have to that have shaped Indo-Chinese relations for some time now, obviously, are in the background um, and very, um, very weighty. Um, and I think the last thing I would say, and I just sort of end with this because I wanted to keep it brief, is to think about how does the pandemic play into this? Now, the COVID pandemic is certainly not a cause of this conflict, but it certainly has facilitated. but in two senses, both opportunities and threats. China, of course, has been very defensive since the onset, the origins of the pandemic. Um, it reacted slowly initially, but then very aggressively and through its own lockdown to get it under control. And of course, since then, it's been on a very sort of defensive posture vis-a-vis um, -vis many critics uh, in the world as to why the pandemic emerged uh, in the way in which it did. And did China alert the international community, other countries quickly enough? So there's a sort of defensive, uh, aggressive nationalism that's taking place in the context of an economic slowdown and mounting economic problems in China. Uh, and so many commentators would say this is an attempt to sort of deflect attention uh, and in a sense to change, to pivot to a different topic. Um, and you can similar see similar, you can make a similar argument perhaps in the case of India as well, of course. Um, on the other hand, what we see is in India, uh, in the United States, in Britain and France, uh, a lot of the major powers West, Russia, of course, is in this situation as well. They've handled the pandemic incredibly badly. Um, and so they're consumed by crisis. And the perception of crisis itself, that these governments have been very ineffective and incapable of really getting control of this. We have a new spike in the United States right now happening again because the, they reversed the lockdown too quickly. They've opened up too fast. You get a sense, again, many commentators have talked about this, that there's a sense in Beijing that this is a change in the, what social movement scholars would call the political opportunity structure in the geopolitical world. That this is a, a moment for China to assert itself 
because other countries are consumed with this pandemic. They've not handled it as well. They're still struggling to handle it. If you look at the level of testing and tracing, quarantining in India, it's alarming and very deeply worrying. You see, of course, in the United States, which have handled it the worst, but even in countries like Britain and France. Um, a lot of the credibility of these governments and their forms of governance have really taken a hit in this pandemic. So I think in that context, these conditions allow China, uh, for reasons which are independent uh, and precede the crisis, but it creates a set of conditions that really facilitate a, a greater assertion of Chinese state power. And we see it in multiple fora, in Hong Kong, of course, the national security law, in Taiwan with a lot of saber laddering, uh, the salami tactics of occupying land and building bases in the South China Seas and the East China Seas, and so on. So I think, um, I think it's in this moment that uh, I think these conditions facilitate um, and encourage some of these developments. And I think that's why they're very deeply worrying and why there's been so much attention on them uh, in India and in many countries around the world. So I'll just, I'll just sort of end there. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, just a follow up to this. <clears throat> I agree with your judgment that the immediate trigger, among other things, was reorganization of the state of JNK because uh, in the 80s, when uh, we, we declared Arunachal Pradesh from U UT to, uh, to, to grant it a full statehood, a similar kind of incident also happened, uh, which took quite a long time to uh, resolve. Uh, but uh, the, a follow-up question to what I uh, wanted to ask, you, what I asked you about uh, the efforts of uh, Modi and Xi. Uh, do you think with the, uh, with the pullback of Chinese and uh, Indian forces from across the line of control, uh, there's going to be a renewed effort to reinvest in uh, public diplomacy that uh, all these leaders have been engaged into, or they're going to withdraw themselves at least for, uh, uh, for the foreseeable future? Well, I sort of say this with a caveat because I've been watching these developments from afar and not, not like all of you in Delhi. Um, my sense is certainly in the first tenure of, the, of, of Prime Minister Modi's uh, of the prime ministership, it's been fairly pragmatic foreign policy uh, that's characterized it. You know, uh, overtures to China for investment, of course, and in infrastructure and various technologies, and worrying about the trade deficit and the imbalances there, reaching out to Japan, um, seeming proximity that's growing with the United States, but always reluctant to sort of say that they're going to become a junior partner in these security lines like Japan or South Korea. So there's a sort of general pragmatism that's taking place. You see a growing shift. I think slowly towards the United States, but in a sense that as many people in Washington would say, um, many advocates of closer relations with the United States and India are always sort of frustrated in Washington why it hasn't been taking place. So that sort of independent, strategic, uh, pragmatic approach, I think has sort of continued. Um, in the case of, of China, I think many commentators that I've been reading now in the last few weeks, increasingly are of the view that whatever tactical advantage the Chinese have gained, through this, over, you know, through this uh, maneuver, uh, to this adventure, in a sense, might be a misadventure in strategic terms, because uh, China has already antagonized uh, through its actions and inactions in many places. Not the only country. The United States has really um, acted very um, destructively in many fora, of course, as we know in the last few years. But China had a lot to gain or lose in terms of how it's acted in, in various multilateral regimes and vis-a-vis -vis various countries in which there are disputes and conflicts. And in that sense, given that it is, uh, its back is against the wall, but it's very assertive now, you see conflicts with the European Union, with the United States, longstanding, of course, issues with Japan, um, even across the, the South China Seas, territorial disputes over lands and islands. To, to to push ahead and, and, and stoke a conflict with India now uh, of this type, to escalate a longstanding dispute in this way, just seems strategically to have been a, a blunder. Um, because for, you could characterize uh, the view from New Delhi for quite some time, um, as always, in a sense, trying to balance China without ever joining any sort of security alliance that China would be concerned about. Now, 
if the way the Chinese are behaving now pushes many in India uh, across the political spectrum to feel that they have to have closer ties and relations uh, to countries that China considers its adversaries, the only one it considers, of course, primarily is the United States, then just from a purely strategic point of view, that seems like a really um, a poor set of choices that have been made in Beijing. And it's hard to imagine that something like this could have happened without some level of uh, cognizance at a very high level uh, that these types of maneuvers are taking place. And again, we've seen a pattern of that, uh, certainly since Doklam, um, of greater assertion of, of Chinese um, in terms of what they regard as their territorial sovereignty. So my sense is that uh, the Modi government, like previous governments, will continue to engage in public diplomacy. There's a lot of pressure on, of course, to stand up, uh, to sort of uh, resist this type of pressure. Um, but I think in that sense, India is in a situation that many Asian countries are in, which is a growing uh, integration and reliance on the Chinese economy, whatever problems it has, um, and a greater security concern about the implications of that uh, in the region. So it'd be very interesting to see how, uh, how the Mandarins in, in New Delhi are considering this uh, in relation to their counterparts in, in Seoul and Tokyo and other Asian countries, because everyone seems to be grappling with this issue. You know, what types of relationships do you have with the United States and China, given that the major conflict is taking place between these two great powers? Um, and every other state has to, in a sense, um, find out what kind, of, what kind of position of stance will it take? Will it accommodate the Chinese? Will it resist the Chinese? And if so, in what way and on what, on what planes, on what, on what, uh, in what institutions? So I, I'm not sure if I fully answered your question, but I think my sense is that um, I, I imagine that this government will, will continue to, to have a, a sort of two-pronged approach, which is uh, try to be constructive public diplomacy uh, to sort of call China out without naming it or sort of any expansionist tendencies. And I think there's a lot of pressure probably on China right now because it's, on, it's, it's facing uh, challenges and criticism on multiple fronts. Um, and in that sense, I think uh, in the short term, it's a tactical advantage, um, but it's hard to see how strategically it plays out in China's favor in the longer term, if it actually inflames distrust in India, uh, certainly, and in other countries towards its actions and its uh, intentions uh, in the next five, 10 years. If, uh, finally, uh, before I move to other experts, uh, just a small uh, uh, sort of, uh, Curiosity, uh, purely in terms of uh, uh, in, in, in from the framework of political psychology. Now, uh, if Xi Jinping is uh, tracking his web on Hong Kong, on Uyghurs, of course, Tibetans for a very long time, mm -hmm. is it also to deflect uh, his or or? or show his assertiveness internally to the CPC? I didn't catch the last bit of your uh, internally, to, internally to the CPC or Communist Party of China? To, yes, I mean... Uh, to, I, to, to I, I, establish his primacy or, or the yeah. supreme leader as they... Uh, well, he's established his primacy for quite some time now. It's the most remarkable purge we've seen in the Chinese Communist Party for decades. Um, and reversing many of the reforms that Deng Xiaoping had, had uh, implemented to avoid uh, any of the chaos that uh, had engulfed China from the Cultural Revolution onwards. Right? Those were all those reforms of, of sharing power and having limits on terms uh, that any, any leader could have. So Xi Jinping, of course, has consolidated his power remarkably, astonishingly, uh, even before this crisis happened, of course. And I think in that sense, uh, there may be tactical or strategic reasons to have um, this assertion of power on his part, but you get a sense that, of course, he's also a true believer in what he's doing, uh, in a sense that uh, I do think there is a, as I've described, a sort of a fierce majoritarian nationalism uh, that he espouses, uh, that China uh, wants to reclaim its rightful place in the world, and, a, and it's a very hierarchical world vision, um, and it sees itself very much as a top. There are lots of critiques we can make of the, of the Western international order, and their legitimate critiques about the imbalance of power uh, between the West and the non-West. And in some senses, you know, there would be some criticisms that China would make, that India would make, that Brazil would make, South Africa, Indonesia, 
uh, many of the countries of Asia and Africa and the Global South towards this order. But the manner in which, of course, China is doing it under Xi Jinping is quite different uh, than happened under Xu Jintao or Jiang Zemin uh, or before that. Um, this is a different kind of power. Uh, and it's, it's a power which is not trying to, uh, um, it's a power that's asserting itself um, and is not as concerned about how others react to it. It's sort of demanding recognition um, of its status, of its weight. And I think that's, a, that's qualitatively different than what we've seen in the past. Um, and I think that in that sense, it's, a, it's an incredibly important moment uh, in geopolitics. And there's a lot at stake uh, in terms of how other, how other powers react. Thank you. Before I let you go, I really enjoyed reading your, uh, uh, your introduction to Perry Anderson's uh, response by Menon and Kaviraj and uh, Partha Chatterjee. Actually, Kaviraj was my, uh, my teacher in JNU. Uh, thank, you. thank you very so much. I apologize again for having to leave. I, I'll have to miss this, but I'll hopefully be able to, to, to see uh, the recording afterwards. I'm sure there'll be another occasion uh, for a more okay. uh, 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 long conversation on the subject. Okay, uh, thank you. Take care. Have a nice day. Okay, uh, uh, let me just uh, 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 sort of move to uh, Jerry Branade. Now, uh, in very many senses, uh, Sanjay has also brought this about the ongoing framework of China and India relationship. And uh, the framework was up until now, uh, that both India and China realize that they have problems, but it is also, uh, there's also cooperation between India and China. So India thought, plus if we work together with China, then in the longer run, areas of collaboration will increase and it'll be a manageable problem. So this is the framework in which uh, we have been operating. But that this framework has been put to test for multiple reasons. One is, of course, uh, the growing realignment of India with, a growing bonhomie of India with uh, the United States. At the, at, the, at the global level, but uh, the Chinese have also uh, sort of contributed their bit to, if you like, to agitate this frame by uh, creating relationship of antagonism between India and its neighbors, recently Nepal, by penetrating the Indian markets and trade uh, deficit that we have with the Chinese, uh, which is close to $60 billion and so on. But then also the, uh, their uh, you know, encirclement of India uh, by laying down the string of pearls and so on. So both sides have contributed to uh, agitate this frame. So this frame is, uh, has held us, held India-China relationship, or within this framework, India-China relationship could be explained. But would this framework hold any good for future, number one, in the light of what has happened uh, in Galwan, and at other points across the LOC, sir. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me here today in such August company. You did refer to the TV, and I must say that uh, you've got a stalwart here who's uh, going to follow, I suppose. <laughs> the framework you spoke about yes. was in 1988, when it was expected that uh, India would be able to catch up that the difference in power 
was not all that great. And given a few years, we would come up. Uh, Rajiv Gandhi's expectation was that as he liberalized the economy and tried to get it moving, uh, India would grow. What happened was that the, uh, the, the framework remained in place, remained static, and remained stagnant. It did not take into account the fact that our power, our power or our growth <clears throat> did not take place at the pace and rate that we expected. Whereas the Chinese power uh, kept growing exponentially. So that was, I think, a major problem or a major defect which was not addressed. It was probably not even recognized for a long period of time. The second thing is, what happened as a result, and it uh, in a way touches on what your question was uh, also, that the Chinese found easy access to our markets. As our markets did not grow, uh, the Chinese entered and began virtually, I would say, hollowing out our economy. Our companies were looking for cash. The Chinese offered them easy access to cash. Uh, they also made them dependent on them for supplies. And as far as the smaller markets are concerned, the trader, uh, the trading community, uh, they were able to produce and supply goods at cheaper costs. So the trader felt that instead of running a business with its attendant problems, he would rather go out and buy it and come. So that is the kind of thing that began happening and increased our dependence on China. It was a dependence that should have been spotted. People were calling out uh, against it, but it should have been spotted. And this is where I feel the government has actually a regulatory role, which otherwise, of course, uh, causes problems. But it has a regulatory role where it should have stopped excessive dependence on a single source. I expect that that will now be addressed. Pharma is one that comes to mind, but there are many others. The other aspect is, as you said, India going, getting closer to the United States, and that upset the Chinese. I think it was not so much a question, and I still believe that, it's not so much a question of India going, uh, getting closer to the United States as the Chinese perceiving the United States as its main rival, in fact, it's only rival now, and as trying to encircle China. And India was one such agent in that effort to encircle it, along with Japan, Vietnam, Singapore, etc. So uh, I think it was a combination. Later on, of course, they felt that we were getting closer to the United States for various other reasons. The Chinese, I feel, understood exactly what we were doing, and they realized that it was not an alliance with the United States against anyone else. But they chose to keep that uh, you know, myth still alive. The third was about their coming into our neighborhood, uh, encircling us. I think there were uh, various points made, like you said, about the string of pearls, uh, encirclement of India. But in my personal opinion, I don't think our reaction was particularly towards that. Our reaction was primarily because of the bilateral needling that China did and because of its insistence, not only on uh, settling the border uh, boundary question as and when it felt like, which say in some time in the distant future, but also uh, that they were blocking us at every stage in our effort to rise above. They wanted to keep us boxed into South Asia and preoccupied with internal problems. So this is the, these are the fundamental differences of how we look. Beijing, of course, feels that it is much better. Its economy is five times more. Its you know, military strength is much greater, etc. And therefore, India should not be a challenge. But mind you, it still looks at India as at least an obstruction, if not a potential challenge. Uh, so this is the broadest strategic scenario uh, but uh, in the immediate, in your assessment, uh, what exactly has been the Chinese intentions and motivations uh, in the scaled up uh, border intrusions, which uh, witnessed loss of life, uh, 
of soldiers and officers, uh, both on Indian and the Chinese side. And uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it is quite intriguing. And a number of people suggest that at least the official position is that we were uh, uh, increasing our broader uh, border infrastructure and therefore the Chinese reacted. Some others are suggesting that it's the reorganization of uh, J and K. In your assessment, what exactly triggered the Chinese uh, uh, sort of forward movement, as it were, uh, along the LOC? I think it was a combination of factors. It was not just one particular factor. Yes. Uh, certainly, there would have been a trigger. We'll try and identify that. But I think it was a combination of factors. And let me list two or three quick ones. Yes. First, uh, Xi Jinping himself, since he came in, uh, uh, Mr. Sanjay Ruparel had uh, tried to speak about the similarities between uh, Xi Jinping and Modi. Um, uh, but looking at Xi Jinping, he, when he came in, he came in with two agenda points which were given to him. The first was to ensure the legitimacy and continued monopoly on power of the Chinese Communist Party, which he did. He also decided that pumping in nationalism would be good in order to boost the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party. While he did that, he also began modernizing and restructuring the People's Liberation Army. He styled himself, as you know, as the chairman of everything. I mean, he was also chairman of the military yes. committee. And he also took, at a point, the, he became the operational commander-in-chief of the PLA. Very unusual, but he did. So you have a situation where he took personal responsibility for modernizing of the People's Liberation Army. And he set timetables, which he seems to be uh, prone to do. And he said by 2021, the People's Liberation Army will be a world-class army and it will be mechanized. By 2035, it will be a world-class army which will be able to win and fight wars. I mean, with everyone. So he had set these benchmarks. He also, of course, carried out massive purges in the PLA in order to get his own grip on it. So that was one aspect that was going on. He was modernizing it. He put his own people. And uh, here I must uh, digress a little bit. Yes. In 1975, when Tang Xiaoping decided to teach Vietnam a lesson, Xi Jinping was the staff officer, or what in the Chinese system they call Mishu or secretary. Uh, if we say secretary, we'll look at a personal assistant. He was not that. He was like a you know, special secretary to the defense minister, Kang Piao. And he saw the effect of that action against Vietnam. Because he was aware that Tang Xiaoping wanted to tell the PLA commanders that your army is not as good as you think. It's bloated, it's lazy, it's corrupt, etc. In fact, that speech is worth reading. And um, when they went in, Xi Jinping had a ringside seat and he saw what happened and then what reforms Tang Xiaoping brought in. So here, having brought in the reforms first, having tried to restructure the PLA, he had it in his mind, I'm sure, to test it, to test the modernization that had taken place. The second factor that comes in here is the, uh, his announcement of a geostrategic architecture to expand China's power well across its borders, in fact, almost around the world, which is the One Belt, One Road, or the Belt and Road Initiative, as they now call it. But the first part of that, to get operationalized was the seventh leg called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. That has a direct implication for us because by operationalizing that, what the Chinese did was they invested not only strategic uh, thought into it, but also financial investments. And so they have now a stake in that area. And that runs through Pakistan, POK, Gilgit, Baltistan, and of course, parts of Aksai Chin where the Chinese already are. So that area, becomes one of concern for them. The pointer to that is that since this announcement in April 2015, every meeting with Indians, whether at the official level, whether at the summit level, whether at the track 1.5, track 2, journalists, academics, whoever, the Chinese had one piece of, if I may call it, advice or instruction to us, which was, please resume talks with Pakistan, ease tensions, resolve Kashmir, 
and then look to improve relations with China. And I'm telling you, telling you this in almost quotes. So that was a sustained mm -hmm. pressure that was put on us. And I think it should have left us in no doubt that the Chinese are unhappy with our objections to the Belt and Road, which are valid objections in my view, but objections, and of course, our refusal to accept the CPEC or the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. After that, we did uh, begin asserting ourselves. They saw that Prime Minister Modi had started acquiring an international stature, which caused them some discomfiture because it meant that India was rising, trying to get out of the South Asia box, as I told you, and join the high table, at least aspire to. And at that time, uh, we revoked Article 370. I think following the strike on Balakot, which is where the terrorist camp was, Jaisa Mahmud camp, uh, they felt that now their assets in this region could be under threat. And therefore, they needed to safeguard it. So I think that was also one of the factors that came in. But apart from that, there was a general, um, shall I say, increase in strain on the India-China relationship. And it came through in different ways. I mean, of course, the action at the NSG, the action regarding Masood Azhar, all those. But even otherwise, the Chinese leaders began hinting that all is not well. Doklam happened. That was an unplanned, shall I say, incident. They didn't expect us to come there and block them and then hold firm. Uh, of course, it conveyed its own message, but they didn't expect that. But they were planning something. And uh, I was frankly expecting something by 2020, if not earlier. So as far as I'm concerned, it was developing. And after Dokla, there were clear indicators that something is going to happen because the number of exercises in Tibet increased. Exercises by infantry, by heavy artillery, by their special forces, including live fire exercises, some major exercises that took place in Tibet and Qinghai, both high altitude areas. Uh, aircraft exercises, and they flew in uh, aircraft from other theater commands to familiarize themselves with this area, as they did with the ground troops. So obviously there was something happening, and there were references to India. All this was in the Chinese language military press. Uh, so it was coming out as to what they were doing. There were also indicators of them getting closer to Pakistan, trying to augment their relationship with Pakistan, but I'll leave that aside. But these are the kind of indicators that we developed. So there was not just one action. And I think the trigger might have been 370 or whatever. And that is why I told you it's difficult to identify one trigger. Because of the manner in which this, if I may call it, operation took place, they massed their troops and brought them at multiple points along, around 1,100 kilometers of the LAC, which is a long stretch from DBO to uh, Nakula and North Sikkim. They also opened up a pressure point or a potential pressure point on the border between Tibet and Bhutan. Now, with such a long stretch, you can imagine the Indian army would have been always looking at two things. One, what is going to happen and where? And secondly, is it going to be in the northern side or the eastern side? So, they were, would have been distracted, and reports you would have followed kept mentioning concentration in Depsong Plains or concentration in Spang, you know, in Spangmur and uh, Pangong or in Galwan. Galwan became the hot point later, and it became the hot point because of the incident where 20 of our personnel were killed, an officer and his men. Uh, but all these things uh, together uh, point to considerable planning having taken place before this operation. Subsequently, we learned about it having been further extended to cover Arunachal Pradesh. Now, uh, no such operation could take place or can take place without the express approval of Xi Jinping. In fact, my personal hunch, and if you accept what I have just mm -hmm. told, is that Xi Jinping not only authorized it, he probably instigated the entire plan and said, let's teach these guys a lesson. So uh, that is how uh, it happened. He's very much there. The responsibility, of course, came down to the Western Theater Commander, who is also a uh, veteran of the 1979 war, 
Uh, he is uh, someone who is quite respected in the People's Liberation Army. He's very close to Xi Jinping. And uh, the, uh, it involved three military sub-districts. Now, this kind of planning doesn't happen without the approval of the Central Military Commission. They also brought in troops from other areas, other theater commands. So this is the scenario. And uh, if I can just, uh, uh, you know, have a few seconds more. Yes, sir. Yes. When this talk is going on now, of disengagement or whatever. I look at it as a tactical step. I look at it as a move where we want to diffuse the tension. And what I think Prime Minister Modi has done with his visit to Ladakh uh, is he has deferred an imminent hostile action uh, by the Chinese. Which may happen. It may still happen. I mean, I think he just deferred that imminent uh, hostile action because of the simple question, if the Chinese just wanted to come and tickle us about Galwan or whatever, then would they have brought such a massive force? Yes. To my mind, they had another objective, which probably has not been finished yet. But part one, they have tested our responses. They've tested our military and political resolve, how we'll hold up against such a thing. And now probably they'll come back for the second round. Or they would have hoped that with this massive show of force, we could cave in and be willing to negotiate whatever they want. That hasn't happened. So I think now we can look forward, um, and I don't mean that in a positive sense, to uh, protracted negotiations before uh, any withdrawal starts. And even now, from what I hear, uh, Swasni will certainly know much more, but from what I hear, the reserve forces and the forces that have been brought in, there is no indication of them moving back. So what we are seeing is only at the particular point. That's, uh, I think that answers the point you raised. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me just get to Suhasini uh, now, and then I come back to you in a while, sir. Okay. Uh, can you hear me, Suhasini? I, I can't hear you. Can, uh, yeah. I can hear you, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, uh, Sir has, uh, and Sanjay, both of them have uh, very elaborately uh, sort of uh, with, uh, uh, with facts and general argumentation have demonstrated that the, that the dragon is right at our door and breathing down our, down our neck. Now, uh, our throat. Uh, so now, what should we do? One of the one of the things that is uh, is being speculated about or written about in uh, in in uh, in newspapers and popular television debates that uh, the Chinese uh, action across the LSE has pushed India into uh, post India closer closer to United States, and it's time to recast our relationship with the United States in much more affirmative sense than it it had been, and also recast our it's an opportunity to recast our relationship with our neighbors. Uh, what uh, 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 sort of what kind of uh, uh, you know, Kind of uh, uh, tendencies uh, uh, do you foresee in those, in at least in these two directions? Please, uh, that is India's neighborhood policy and India's relationship with United States at the backdrop um, of what the Chinese have done. Uh, you know, Professor Singh, uh, and I, I, I must, uh, you know, thank you for putting it so well because the truth is that um, we have one conflict point, of course, between India and China, which is at the line of actual control, 3,488 kilometers. And that is going to be a, a constant worry. But there are so many other spheres where we are running into conflict with China. And we have to recognize each one of them. So one is uh, the maritime sphere, where in the past, maybe we had kept our spheres of influence separately. But, uh, and you know, you can look at it as a chicken and egg situation. Did China start uh, to get closer? Uh, to, did China get more aggressive in the South China Sea and, and move towards the Indian Ocean 
uh, first or was India uh, first in, in tying up, uh, you know, with other maritime powers? It, it, you know, it has been it has been positive that it wasn't until 2015 in January when um, uh, when we saw the joint vision statement between India and the U.S. on the Asia Pacific that China really reacted strongly because, you know, the announcements of the CPEC, which had been put off for a long time, was only made after that. So there has been the suggestion that uh, one is reacting to the other, the other is reacting uh, to the other. But the fact is that today the Indo-Pacific, whether it is the Pacific Ocean or the Indian Ocean, has become a new frontier, if you like, uh, between the two countries in, 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 the, in the maritime sphere. Uh, and the third conflict point or the third frontier between the two, or fault line, if you'd like to put it that way, yeah. is India's neighborhood. Now, we uh, maybe decades ago heard about the string of pearls. The fact is that now we have to go by fact. We no longer have to look at intention. We have to go by the fact that each one of India's neighbors, with the exception of Bhutan, became a member of the Belt and Road Initiative, even though India made it very clear. This was not in India's interest and did not see it in other countries' interest. India has tried for alternative formations with Japan, with the US, but the fact remains that each of these countries remain in a, as a part of China's infrastructure program. Second, that each of these countries, and here with the exception of Bhutan and Nepal, and who knows what will happen in Nepal next, um, each of these countries actually today do more trade with China than India does. This is the exact reverse of the situation that we saw just five to six years ago. I think uh, the uh, Observer Research Foundation had brought out uh, a study that showed that just in 2014, the situation was that India actually was ahead in most of these countries. And today that situation has been turned over. China actually does more trade with them. Uh, as far as Nepal goes, we know the turnaround in relations that has followed after uh, 2016 and the blockade, um, uh, you know, and, and the fact that Nepal went and signed an eight-point infrastructure agreement with China, has now opened a second uh, boundary point on the north, uh, is expecting to see the Tibet or the Qinghai uh, uh, rail line coming as well uh, to uh, ne Nepal, is expecting to see Chinese uh, investment in various projects as well. So now we've got this situation in the neighborhood, uh, which India is going to have to react to. I do not think, and uh, this is my own subjective opinion, I do not think that India has managed its relationship with Nepal as it should have. There are enough people who will turn around and say that, uh, you know, it is Nepal who cast the first stone with its offensive map that includes Indian territory. But I think at the end of the day, two countries that have so much history between them, uh, and, uh, and, and, and a country like India that, uh, you know, qualifies, I think, 80% of Nepal's trade actually comes uh, through India. To not have been able to see this coming, to not have put diplomatic capital into this relationship, I think this is, this is, a, is a huge oversight uh, by our government. But I think the trend is something that we do have to uh, deal with. You ask the second question, which is okay. So this is India and its neighborhood. It will always have its problems, but it lives in its neighborhood. India is situated in its geography. Regardless of whether we speak to Pakistan or not, it remains on our, uh, yes. you know, <clears throat> on our Western flank. It's, mm. it's not going anywhere. Um, so we are going to have to deal with it. There are those who feel that had we kept up some kind of communication with Pakistan, and we have zero right now, um, over the last six years, we may not have been in the situation today where a two-front situation for India does not just seem possible or probable. It seems quite uh, like that will be the next step. If things with India and China go bad, that's, that two-front scenario is becoming extremely likely. And I think that conversation that the two foreign ministers of Pakistan and China had last week made it very clear that uh, you know, they will stand together on issues including Kashmir and you know you mentioned article 370 I think we saw a real coming together of Pakistan and China when it came to the reaction to article 370 whether it was China uh, really uh, helping Pakistan get its voice out at the United Nations or or any of the others the truth is that 
Um, whether we like it or not, today when we talk about the western flank, uh, when we talk about the eastern Ladakh flank, when we talk about these areas, they are all coalescing for three reasons. And I'll be very brief here. The three reasons are essentially, first, that China does have its historical idea of where the Tibetan boundaries were when it comes yeah. to Ladakh. And Xi Jinping has said this, uh, I think, to an American uh, leader some years ago, we will take back every inch of territory that our forefathers or our ancestors may have given away. The second, that increasingly India's infrastructure uh, is something China seeks to curtail the infrastructure building along the LAC, simply because they do not want to have a situation where India has access to what they see as their future line, which is that not just the CPEC line, but the Karakoram uh, connections to CPEC as well. And the third, and I think we overlook this all the time, is that the areas we are talking about, you know, we talk about BRI and say we cannot be a part of BRI because all these areas are, you know, a part of uh, Pakistan occupied Kashmir and areas claimed by India. But the truth is, for China, the uh, the areas we are talking about, Gilgit, Baltistan, um, and uh, and parts of COK, are actually just about their real Achilles heel, which is Xinjiang. Uh, and I think we overlook that every time because we don't, maybe we don't see Indian um, aspirations in that regard. But uh, for for your adversary. Uh, the fact that India did 370, the fact that uh, there was the bifurcation with Ladakh on one side, Jammu and Kashmir on one side, the fact that uh, we have increased our infrastructure, and the fact, um, and I know lots of people have spoken about this, but our Home Minister went into Parliament and, and reaffirmed that Aksai Chain was part of the territory that we would be taking back, but also be okay. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is this is coalescing, that if India is, in, uh, if in any way is, is suggesting that it is going to go back and take some part of Pakistan occupied Kashmir, that is not just going to face Pakistan, you are going to face China as well. My final point, and I'll, I'll leave it over here, geopolitically, the impact will be, and I, I'm in a complete minority here when I say this, we will continue to strengthen our ties with the United States, but we are not moving from our centrist position. And the reason I say to you this is commentators can say what they like. I will go by what the Indian government did. The only visit that we have really undertaken diplomatically in the last few weeks because of the coronavirus uh, pandemic, but was the defense minister's visit to Moscow. He made that visit at a particular time. It came after the, the Galwan clash. Uh, he made certain uh, uh, statements there. There are messages that have gone out. Our foreign minister took part in the Russia-India-China trilateral just days after the Galwan crash had happened. And there was so much anger in India over the killing of Indian soldiers. What am I trying to say here? The truth is that regardless of how much we talk about strengthening ties with the U.S., our geographic reality will always bring us back to the center. Uh, and remember, the defense minister made a statement about the S-400, about expediting deliveries of the S-400, something the U.S. reacted to straight away. We had a statement from the State Department saying, please don't forget our concerns uh, on this issue and over CASA. So what I'm trying to just say over here is that India will continue to be, uh, to be situated in its geography. We might have a maritime conflict with China, and we will have to find new ways to deal with that. We might have a conflict in our region. We we'll find new ways to re deal with that. But the truth is that that 3,500 kilometer boundary between the two of us will continue to define India's immediate concerns and immediate threat perceptions when it comes to China. Uh, so what, uh, I, I actually think that a lot of what we are going to see over the next few weeks um, and months is probably a reassertion of some of our own original ideas. I do agree, though. Uh, that we are going to need a completely new way of looking at China because this is a new threat perception that has come from China. We, we are in uncharted territory when it comes to the killings of Indian soldiers along the LAC, which we haven't seen before. I'll leave it there. So uh, just a follow-up uh, comment on your, uh, on your last point uh, about India and Russia. Also, the Russians and the Chinese uh, uh, sort of see the Americans as a common enemy. Uh, so they do not, at least Russians do not have uh, any incentive to, uh, to listen to the Chinese or do they have the, 
do they or are they obliged to listen to the Chinese while extending their helping hand to India? Either you know, this is a, this or is a, a point of worry. And, and please do look at the readout that we have seen between the Russian president, uh, Mr. Putin, and the Chinese uh, president, Xi Jinping, today, uh, which says very clearly that they will defend each other's uh, uh, territorial integrity. I'm not completely sure of the wording, but it basically is of the essence that China and Russia will stand together, not just when it comes uh, to other issues, but they will uh, they will undertake to stand together on areas where they feel that territorial integrity is, is hurt. I don't know how New Delhi will react um, to, these, uh, to these assertions. It may just be diplomatic language. Um, but I think that, that, that there is always going to be a little bit of a cause for worry. In fact, I think Indian uh, strategic thinkers have for a long time said that we need to build our relationship with Russia. There is no point in, in trying, in just saying we aren't going to be a part of it. And I think India has been very pragmatic. I mean, we are, at the same time as we are part of the Quad and all the rest, we are part of the RIC, we are part of the BRICS, we are part of the SCO, we joined the SCO only a couple of years ago. Um, and, uh, and India is, is uh, a, a part of these formations to explain that, as I said, that we will continue to be uh, situated in this geography. There is no point assuming that we have white knights coming across, uh, you know, in, um, and, and setting up bases anywhere close by, because we do have our own reality over here. Mm -hmm. So we continue to operate uh, uh, with multipolarities and... Uh... Many, many, many bilateral relationships which have been, uh, which have uh, uh, stood the test of the time historically and so on. Is that what you're saying? I think so. And I think we do also need to remember something. I mean, everybody, uh, as, as, as uh, you know, I think uh, Mr. Rangeli also said, everybody has become a, a sort of uh, expert on satellite imagery. Everyone's become an expert yeah, yeah. on what China <laughs> is thinking. Everybody is an expert. But I think if there's one part of Chinese psychology that has been seen over the years, and remember, the, the India-US-China triangle has been discussed and, and, and spoken about so often, including from the 1962 war, including from the situation with Tibet um, and, and the invasion of Tibet as well. Um, but I think there is one part to that reality, which is as long as India is engaging China directly and is not part of some grouping to take on China, China deals with India in a slightly different way than it does when it, it assumes that India is already part of a grouping against it. I think Prime Minister Modi put it very well originally at Shangri-La when he said that for us, uh, the Indo-Pacific is a geographical concept. It is not a strategic construct. I don't know if that's going to change now. Uh, and in the next few weeks will tell us whether the government is rethinking this uh, idea. But I do think it's important to remember that eventually India will deal with China bilaterally. We said this at the highest levels, and I don't think that there is a real shift in thinking on that. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, let me go back to Rana Desar once again. Uh, uh, sir, I, I just wanted you to share your views on, uh, on the geopolitical benefits uh, that the Chinese are drawing out of the huge trade imbalance that they have with India, almost close to about 60 plus billion dollars. Now in such a situation, if, uh, if uh, a future conflict of sorts happen as uh, uh, many in the strategic uh, community anticipate what kind of leverages India would have uh, against China, which could be effectively exercised to 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 curtail the Chinese ambition uh, of uh, salami slicing or uh, you know claiming territories. Well, uh, as far as the economy is concerned. I don't think that's a leverage. I know that many people have been talking about uh, China being attracted by the uh, market here and that being a lever. Uh, I think that time is past. The Chinese have made it very clear that as far as sovereignty issues are concerned, they trump anything else, sovereignty and territorial integrity. So uh, they, they have been claiming, uh, you know, the whole of Ladakh 
they've been claiming Arunachal, all old uh, territories that uh, Tibet supposedly uh, exercised authority over. And uh, the, at a time when the Chinese claimed that they had sovereignty over Tibet, which is questionable, but still. The fact is you can't keep going back in history. Uh, and uh, that is the position that we have taken. We inherited a certain boundary. And uh, whereas if they want to negotiate it a few inches here or there, a few feet here and there, that's fine. But you can't unilaterally say that, you know, this is ours, this is ours, this is ours. For example, Tawang first came into the discussion in 2005. Whereas we've been having joint working group talks with them, SR level talks with them, etc. For, for much longer. Uh, so all of a sudden, it was the sensitivity of the Tibetan people which prompted them to come out of this. Then uh, Ladakh, the first statement about Ladakh was in April 2013. And then again, of course, it was repeated during this crisis. Galwan, first statement on Galwan, China having exercised sovereignty for long over Galwan was in 2000, it was uh, on the 17th of May. So what I'm trying to say is that as far as China is concerned, it keeps laying claim to territories and uh, you know, uh, changing the goalposts. I do remember um, uh, Swasni referred to uh, uh, the statement by Xi Jinping to an American official that was in 2012, shortly after he took over, or maybe just before he was about to take over. But I remember after the 18th Party Congress in 2012, when Xi Jinping announced the China Dream, the third part of which is the uh, recovery, as they call it, of all the territories that China had lost through the imposition of unequal treaties by foreign hostile powers. So, which includes, of course, the whole of Ladakh, Arunachal, Sikkim, Nepal, Bhutan, you know, the whole lot. Now, there was a vice chairman of the CPPCC, the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, their political advisory body, who had come here and he was giving a talk in the ORF. And he came in December, which is barely a month after the uh, 18th Party Congress. And he had spoken about various issues. He spoke about the China dream. And I asked him a question after the conference. I said, look, um, in the China dream, the way you spelt it out, it means also recovery of territories that are already within the boundaries of other countries. So he said, yes, if, that, if they belong to China. I said, for example, what about Arunachal? What about Ladakh? He said, you know, as a school child, I read about these territories being Chinese territories. So we have to get them back. It was as simple as that. So I frankly do not expect any change in Chinese thinking or behavior. Second, uh, just stemming from that is Xi Jinping's own statements. He wants to fulfill the dreams and ambitions of, the, of his forebears. So that is what he's set about doing and all this time we have deluded ourselves by talking about friendship with China, by talking about, you know, building up Bonhomi with the Chinese. Uh, it's a myth and we should have seen through it a long time ago, which we didn't, chose not to, I suppose. Uh, I hope that doesn't come back to settle over our relationship again. But, uh, you know, these are the issues that we need to really look at. And I think Swasiti was right when she spoke about are not going one way or the other are uh, sticking to our you know, central position. But I think we will see a strengthening of the relationship with the United States and other countries, like-minded countries, in various fields, you know, without uh, uh, being allies. I don't think India can ever be an ally of anyone. In any case, neither the US nor the China, now China believes in allies. They believe in junior partners, and I don't think we want to bet over that. So that's how uh, uh, I see the situation. And what you were saying, about, uh, I think, how will we go ahead? I mean, what are the leverages we hope to have? I think there are a lot of leverages. The first thing is, I would say, uh, is to restrict uh, China's space in India. In our market, ours is the largest market in the world which is untapped. The US and Europe are much lar larger, they're much uh, wealthier, but they're both at the moment disabled because of COVID. And once COVID lifts, I don't expect the US market to open to the Chinese. They've already made that abundantly clear. It's both the parties, regardless of who wins. Similarly, Europe. So 70% of that market is going to be closed to the Chinese. That is one reason why they're desperate to come in here, which is why 
the uh, Chinese ambassador's statement of today, um, which I think Swasti may be aware of, where he spoke about, you know, uh, we should not let these things interfere with our relationship, you know, peace is supreme. Uh, what happened to all that uh, talk just a month ago? I mean, uh, you know, it wasn't there. And yesterday, mind you, or was it early this morning, the Global Times carried a similar article. So they're looking at this as a market. They're not looking at us, you know, that, okay, let's make peace for peace's sake. So uh, that is one leverage we have, and we must restrict their space, we must squeeze it. Second thing, we must stop them from coming in here and trying to, as I call it, mold the minds of the young. I mean, they're coming in here, they're setting up, you know, or trying to set up Confucius Institute. Uh, they have set up one or two, one underhand, one legal, which, uh, uh, you know, where they teach you China's version of history. Now, we may dismiss it, but the fact is when you're teaching, uh, you know, children or youth between uh, 16 and 22, 23, 24, one version of history, that's what they're going to estimate. Similarly, when they go out and come back. So these areas have to be squeezed. Second, uh, we have Tibet and Xinjiang, two huge fault lines as far as China is concerned, which can be tapped. There are many ways of doing it. Nepal, I think um, uh, Swahasli spoke about Nepal. I quite agree with her that the signs were there uh, as to which direction they were drifting in. And I'm not talking only about China. I'm even talking about drifting away from us. We should have stepped in and tried to, you know, uh, contain it. We didn't, for whatever reason. Uh, that's a subject of another discussion, I suppose. But uh, Nepal is another fault line that they have because there's a Tibetan community. And there are Tibetans who are, uh, uh, what shall I say, uh, they're um, uh, worshippers, if I may use the word, uh, of the Dalai Lama. They respect the Dalai Lama. And they're settled in the northern corner of Nepal uh, with uh, Tibet. Some of them are even MPs in Nepal. They don't call themselves uh, boats or Tibetans because they don't want to be discriminated against. But they are. So, you know, there are a number of fault lines that we can use. The other are the um, uh, countries like Japan, Vietnam, and us. Uh, we have uh, relationships. We can use those. And the third point is, why are we hesitant in raising issues uh, with just the Chinese, with to us repeatedly? Why don't we at their uh, new, uh, proliferation record? Why don't we hammer away at their human rights record? Things like that. We, there are a number of areas we can open up, provided we get over our diffidence of if I may say, not annoying, but upsetting the Chinese, which we hang up we have. So things like that, uh, you're saying leverages, there are a lot of them, uh, which we can use, but we have to first start uh, restricting their space here, because that is automatically not only hollowing us out, but also creating pro-China lobbies within India. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll again come back to Suhasni. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, Jadev sir has spoken uh, largely about the leverages uh, that we can uh, uh, sort of uh, effectively use against China, the, the, the Tibetans settled in the northern part of Nepal and so on, and uh, Taiwan and uh, Tibet issue in World Vietnam and so on. I, I want to prod you on uh, the overall direction of in Indo US relations. It can be used. The American uh, support, ex as, as uh, Americans as an external support, as a leverage to withstand the Chinese pressure. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm asking you, I'm asking this question again and again to you because I uh, saw one of your conversations with Ashley Tellis and in which, uh, well, he was uh, uh, putting across his point of view as to why uh, India and US are natural allies, are uh, going to be natural allies in times to come. You nodded, but you also seem to disagree with that. 
but uh, so that's why I, uh, I'm the, I'm prodding you. No, you're absolutely right. I, I'm nodding out of politeness, but uh, the, the yeah. truth is uh, that I, I maintain this, the same thing I said earlier, which is that eventually India's fault line with China is 3,500 kilometers of an undemarcated line of actual control. Uh, I fail to see in what manner we expect the United States to help uh, in any way, uh, you know, to be a part of that uh, confrontation that we are. I can understand that we will uh, gain all kinds of strategic um, equipment from them, that they will help us with information. They're already helping us with satellite information data and all the rest of that. Uh, but I really fail to see what those who think that the U.S. and India can, you know, sort of together take on China on that fault line are actually referring to. Are we talking about, uh, you know, American boots on the ground at a time when the U.S. is worldwide in retrenchment? I sincerely doubt it. Now, we do know that the U.S. and China have their own dynamics. And right now, the U.S. has decided that China is their biggest uh, rival up till I think uh, two years ago it was China and Russia today I think it's much more China there's a bipartisan consensus that the US's biggest challenge now comes from China uh, so there is that dynamic does India want to be on that bandwagon that's that's the real question uh, I, I, uh, I completely agree with Mr. Ranade when he says that uh, India needs to guard itself um, from Chinese, uh, you know, the, the trade imbalances and, and from a possible cultural uh, sort of uh, um, push from China over here. But I still don't see how else we will deal with it except bilaterally. A stronger India will have to deal with this stronger China. I don't think an India piggybacking on any other power is going to be able to deal with this China. I think in every respect, we are going to have to give back measure for measure, which is why I have to say that I, I, I do think that the current uh, pause that we have on the LAC that has come out of this disengagement process is just a pause. This is not the end of it. And certainly, if we continue to allow uh, buffer zones to be created, which are essentially on land claims by India, if we continue to say that we are okay with not patrolling areas that we were okay with patrolling earlier, uh, regardless of how much you know we are able to make Chinese uh, troops move back, I think we are walking into very dangerous territory because the message that is going out to China is that India does not feel confident about dealing with this threat on its own right now. Um, so, uh, so I, I know this is a sort of dual message I'm, I, I'm giving out there, but I don't think the answer to your question is I don't see how on this fault line. India and any other world power can work. Are we talking about bases being given in India? Not at all. Are we talking about allowing foreign troops in India? That's unheard of. Uh, so, so, you know, when we say these things, it's, it's, it's one thing to say them and uh, the commentaries can continue to say them. As I said, I will go by what I see the government being able to do on the ground. And what the signals uh, that, that, you know, the, the establishment in India has consistently given out that India is a country that has held on to its idea of strategic autonomy at, at great cost, whether it was with Russia, whether it was with the US, whether it's been with other countries. There is a reason why this idea of strategic autonomy has carried on because not none of these world powers, if you like, um, work in isolation. And, and you're um, involving any of them, if you like, in your bilateral relationships will have a consequence. I'll give you one more example of where I see a troubling consequence of this idea that we will tie up with other countries. Today in the neighborhood, we've all said we are worried about China's uh, inroads into the neighborhood. Do we also ask where is the real competition now? In Nepal, for example, the competition seems to be between China's BRI and the US. And the U.S.'s idea of the MCC that they are now promoting inside Nepal, and one of the uh, recent, uh, uh, you know, rifts in the in the cabinet, if we wanted to go into that, was essentially because the prime minister and uh, the chief of the party were on two sides about whether to accept U.S. Uh, funding, which the prime minister was in favor of, um, or not. And 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 uh, in Sri Lanka, we see the same kind of situation where India might get cut out of its own regional rivalry 
simply because you will see a US China rivalry playing out there. So I think we have to guard not only our strategic autonomy, we have to guard our entire regional autonomy in that sense. The same goes for the Indian Ocean. We can uh, tie up with any number of navies, but I think it was our naval chief who said that we will actually militarize only with countries that actually are, region, uh, are oceanic powers or, or have boundaries, uh, maritime boundaries with India. These things are said for a reason. I think it's, you know, we can, we can talk in hypotheticals about some world where, you know, the US and China neatly divide up all their friends and all their friends and the rest being enemies of each other. I don't think India wants to be a part of that world. I don't think India uh, has, uh, uh, you know, has in fact, uh, has a, a, a benefit in being part of a world that is neatly divided into two poles, uh, when actually India's greatest challenges are still internal. I, and I think the coronavirus has shown that, that the two so-called leaders of the world ended up showing that they weren't uh, great at giving leadership. China did not even warn the world about the pandemic. The US seems to have had a healthcare crisis and uh, in, in fact was hoarding um, uh, remedies rather than trying to be a world leader when it was most needed. Okay. I'm um, afraid I will have to stop you now and go back to uh, Ranade sir for the last round because we have very limited time. I'm extremely sorry about this. No, no, go ahead. In fact, there are some questions I was trying to answer uh, 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 from, uh, from the audience as well. Okay. Uh, the largely students are listening to our conversation. <laughs> uh, uh, sir, uh, if I may ask, uh, uh, has there been any, has there been any uh, kind of uh, strategic payoff or geopolitical benefits that the China uh, that, or the, that the Chinese have uh, or may derive out of the current conflict or standoff? Uh, <clears throat> before I answer your question, I just want to add a couple of points to uh, what was being said. The first is uh, when you spoke about India and China and uh, our maybe aligning with someone else. I think within the Indian government for years, but certainly uh, now also, uh, there is a very clear understanding that when push comes to shove, the Chinese are going to resort to the use of force along the border. And we are the ones who are going to face it. So uh, I don't think we are looking at uh, anyone else coming to our support, maybe in terms of providing intelligence or, you know, and mind you, everyone sells military hardware, no one gifts it. So, mm, yes, yes. Uh, you know, it's a business deal. So I think that is one thing that we should be clear that in, in India, India, no one is uh, thinking of those lines. Secondly, uh, Swasti spoke about the world being cut into two and, you know, the Chinese pole and the American pole and someone being on one side or the other. Let me just clarify here that that's what the whole contest is about. The Chinese want to share the world and tell the Americans that, look, you look after one half, we look after the other half, etc. The Americans are saying nothing doing. We are the top dog. You will remain below. So that's one problem. We certainly don't want to get into that. And I think that is where, you know, whether you call it strategic autonomy, whether you call it independence, whatever, uh, comes into play. And particularly, uh, our effort to start now building up our own indigenous industry, which has been neglected for a long time. So that's one. But your question was uh, specifically um, on... Uh, the strategic payoff, that the dividend that uh, the Chinese may derive out of the situation. I don't think the Chinese are deriving any benefit out of this, frankly. Their timing was wrong. Their action was wrong. Uh, they have particularly chosen a time when they calculated that India would have been uh, hit by the pandemic the Indian armed forces would have been hit by the pandemic, and they were saying that in their uh, writing. Um, they've been proved wrong. Uh, I think um, they also chose a time when the United States, Europe, others were down with the pandemic, and they said, calculated no one would be able to come to India's assistance. Uh, I think uh, they realized that that doesn't really work that way. Third, there, was, there has already been an exponential growth in anti-China sentiment in the world, thanks to coronavirus. Now, uh, we may say that that is not, uh, you know, based on fact or otherwise, that's immaterial. The fact is that there is uh, an anti-China sentiment which, is, which has grown exponentially, uh, and the Chinese are very worried about it. In fact, their own, uh, their think tank, 
uh, called the Chinese Institute for Contemporary International Relations, which is a think tank of their foreign intelligence establishment, had prepared a note and briefed the Politburo, including Xi Jinping, talking about this rise in uh, anti-China sentiment and uh, apprehending that the United States will fan those sentiments to push uh, the uh, trend towards a recession inside China and cause social upheaval, leading even to conflict. That's what they said. And there have been a number of other studies which have been done later. They're very, very concerned about the sharp and unstopping or unceasing deterioration in US-China relations. So they're looking at various ways of trying to put a stop to it. So I think on balance, they have lost a lot. And by targeting India, um, uh, you know, the world attention has come to it. So everyone is watching what is going on. Everyone is looking at it. And no one has missed the fact that Xi Jinping himself is under a lot of pressure within China. And uh, the, they are uh, uh, they're beginning to understand, or they are understanding, that a lot of what he has done is in order to impress his own people or show his own people that uh, you know, the Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy is intact. That is why Hong Kong, that is why the push on Taiwan, and that the leadership's ambition to achieve what they call the two centenary goals, which is the China dream and the rivaling of the United States by 2049, will happen and it's well in their hand. The people beginning to feel that the leadership has lost its grip. The grip. So I think uh, the combination of factors and uh, they have misjudged uh, you know, their actions and uh, uh, I, I think it's cost them a lot. And they have, they've also lost quite a bit of Indian market. Well, they've lost Indian goodwill. I was telling uh, some friends the other day, including Chinese, I said, you know, Indian diplomats love to put a gloss on everything. So they call it trust deficit. I said, <laughs> you'll find the truth is it's absent trust. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, the last question to you, you Swasni. Uh, how do you uh, foresee the Indo-China relationship uh, in the next uh, uh, in the near term, so to speak? Well, I think there are three obvious options ahead of us. And, um, you know, the first is in the short term, this could get worse. Another conflagration of the kind we saw at the Galwan Valley, any kind of violence of this sort, uh, is going to lead us uh, to a much larger conflict. I don't think there are any two uh, views about that. Uh, and this would take us back decades. Uh, the second is a diplomatic south. Um, the idea that we would actually bring down the diplomatic uh, contact between the two. I think the government has shown that it does not want that because the government is in fact stepping up the diplomatic contact between the two countries. Um, I, I'll give you an example. Today we have had the working mechanism of, uh, on consultation and coordination for Indo-China border affairs take place. This is across but ministry. MEA, uh, yeah, WMCC, MEA, MOD, MHA, ITDC, all of them. Um, and uh, this is the second time we've met in two weeks, when actually over a course of eight years, since they were first started in 2012, they have met 16 times. So uh, clearly the government is upping the intensity of talks between the two. The big question I think is going to be, is the informal summit between the leaders going to happen or not? Because Prime Minister Modi has personally taken a lot of questioning about the fact that he met Chinese president 18 times in the last six years. Um, and uh, then these two informal summits that actually happened after Dokla. Uh, and still, we don't seem to have made any headway, forget on the trust, as uh, Mr. Ranade said, but also, you know, any concrete headway on actually delimiting, demarcating this boundary, which everybody will agree that good fences make good neighbors. A delineated map is actually going to be the only way to stop these kind of, uh, uh, kind of conflicts. Um, but uh, we haven't seen much movement on that. So those are the two options. And the third is, uh, and this was suggested uh, by uh, others uh, and not just me, that if you look at the period from 1986 to 1993, that's when India had this six or seven year long uh, conflict with China, standoff with China at the border called, at Sundaram Chu. Uh, and that actually led to not just the visit by the prime minister there, but then to the 1993 uh, peace and tranquility agreement. So can this become a catalyst for better bilateral relations? I would understand that given the geopolitical situation and the way everything has got mixed up and the US-China rivalry is mixed up, 
with our situation, the corona rivalry, um, and uh, the kind of hurt people feel with the way China has behaved over the corona pandemic. I think all of that has got mixed up. But if there is a, a, a chance for a better relationship, uh, and you know, I am uh, uh, I'm I'm often called a peacemaker, so uh, I will uh, you know I will not agree with Mr. Ranade when he says we have to cut off, we have to you know finish all uh, India-China ties uh, economically, socially, culturally. Uh, I think uh, we do have to remember, and I think the Chinese ambassador said this. We do have to remember we have a 2,000-year-old history between the two countries and one war so far. Um, we do have to remember that we have this geography between us and we are not going to be able to obliterate the other. Um, and, and therefore, the only way forward, in my mind, would be an entirely new construct between the two countries, an entirely new understanding. No more of this, I agree, no more of this grandiose kind of two leaders can go into a room and sort out problems that have not been solved in 70 years kind of delusion. But uh, certainly a much more realistic approach by both countries, and for that, both Delhi and Beijing have to be willing. Okay, let's hope for the best. And, uh, uh, however, having said that, I will. Uh, Mr. Ranade is getting the last word. I, I, I will. I will say. Just I will. I don't off. I said restrict severely, of course. Okay. Uh, so, uh, hope for the best, but uh, the fact remains the underlying uh, uh, factor which, uh, which, uh, which plays a very decisive role in India-China relationship is mutual suspicion. I wish it could vanish, but uh, it's becoming more stronger than ever. Uh, but it was a fascinating conversation, uh, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your kind presence and also Suhasni for uh, enriching us with your thoughts and uh, our students. So we're all uh, very, very grateful to you. And let me thank both of you on behalf of NLU Delhi Engage. I'm sure there'll be another occasion to have a longer conversation and more, uh, uh, more uh, uh, sort of, uh, yeah, uh, talk on the subject or other subjects. Thank you, sir. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.